Praise God. You know, that last song, Comfort and Joy, God has just been really putting, I've got neighbors all over the place with the big joy signs. They're about this big, and they got joy in there. I don't know what it is, but the Lord is just really showing me this year, joy, joy. In the midst of all that's going on, joy, comfort and joy. Remember, our comfort and joy is in Him, right? And uh, so keep the joy. There's so many distractions, so many things out there, but let's keep the joy. And we're going to keep the joy by keeping our eyes on the prize, Jesus Christ. Amen? And so let's keep our eyes on him. Hallelujah. Well, hey, we're in the middle of a three-part series, a little mini-series, I guess you could say, the Christmas story. And, um, and if you will stand and turn in your Bibles to, or in your phones, whatever you do, Luke chapter 1. And uh, last week, we, of course, we started this story. It was, uh, the subtitle was the Christmas Story, The Preparation. Today, uh, we're going to get into a little bit something different. And so, um, but we discussed numerous people who uh, had found themselves in the middle of this story unbeknownst to them, other than really two people that we talked about, uh, they were surprised. And uh, I talked about how, how God prepared them uh, so differently, each one of them, uh, that a Savior would be born, the long-awaited Messiah. And uh, today in part two in the series, the subtitle God gave me is The Examination. Uh, even before Jesus was, was born, and uh, as his birth was foretold, and, and soon after, the hearts of those who were part of the story would be examined and revealed, wouldn't it? God would uh, kind of examine. We'd see some things as we read through the scriptures. We see how some of their hearts, were, where they were in, in, at that time and what they were thinking and how they were. And so how many know God examines our hearts, doesn't he? Amen. So, uh, so Jesus' birth and all that surrounds it, uh, surrounds it have uh, revealed many things uh, in the heart of man. Some good, some great some not so good, and some downright terrible. And so let's go to Luke chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 26. It should be up on your screen. The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of a greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the hope Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who has, was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. You know, I think we need to say that. Let's stop right there. Let's say that. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, God. I thank you that nothing is impossible with our God. All things are possible. Lord, when we, get our, we wrap our minds around that, Lord, we just, it opens up our eyes to say, wow, God is so big. And we want to be a part of that story, God. We know that we fit in that story somewhere, Lord. Reveal to us our part in this story. The story's still going. And so, Lord, uh, just uh, speak to our hearts today. Take these uh, lips of clay and, God, anoint them. And, and, Lord, speak to us what you want us to speak to us. May we walk out of here differently than we walked in here. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, hey, I want to start out today's message with Mary. Um, not, a, not only do we just read about her, uh, but she is the first person on earth to learn really of the Messiah's official arrival. So now it's been, it's been officially told to her. It's, it's now. And so, uh, but think about it. She was young. She was poor. She was a female, of course. And, and with these characteristics, or as we would say today, maybe these credentials or their lack thereof, uh, the people of her day might be tempted to think um, she couldn't be used by God for any major task. Really? Uh, how about the town she was from, Nazareth? 
when Nathaniel, who would soon be a disciple, found out that Jesus was from Nazareth, he said, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Think about that. The town was a city of Galilee in a remote part of the country. So this little town way off, it's not like Grand Rapids or Detroit or Lansing. It's this little thing way off somewhere, right? Far from Jerusalem, which was the center, of course, of Jewish life. And uh, it was the center of Jewish worship, Jerusalem was. So everybody, you know, would obviously know Jerusalem. It's kind of like when I say I'm from Rockford. Oh, Rockford, Illinois. I mean, people would think right away Rockford, or that comes up on the phone. If you put up Rockford, it goes Rockford, Illinois. Why? It's a city of 100, 120,000. This city is maybe 5,000. So people know the bigger cities, right? But this was located on a major trade route, which was frequently used by Gentile merchants and Roman soldier, soldiers. And because of that, it had a tarnished reputation by the Jews. And because it was considered as a non-religious, uneducated town, it was called the Galilee of Gentiles. Folks, that was not a positive reference. The Galilee of Gentiles, okay? Kind of those, eh, those people, you know, those uneducated, yeah, those non-religious folk, you know, those guys. So in the midst of all this, here's this 12, 13, maybe 14-year-old poor, virgin, peasant girl pledged to a man named Joseph, right? Living out her normal everyday life in the town of Nazareth. It's in this backdrop of after 400 years of silence from God, other than his visit, of course, by the angel to Zechariah, that the angel Gabriel shows up. He announced her to her that she has found favor with God and that she is with child and will give birth to a son and his course is to name him Jesus. She knew that this announcement could cause her much pain, much uh, inconvenience, right? A lot of things could happen. Her peers would ridicule her because in that culture, in that time, if a young unmarried girl uh, became pregnant, uh, it could be disastrous for her. Unmarried pregnant women could actually be stoned to death. In fact, many times they were stoned to death in that culture at that time. Think about that. So where are her thoughts probably going? You would think some of those thoughts have to be going there, right? Not like today where, oh, they're living together. Okay, whatever, doesn't matter. Well, that wasn't the case back then. Thank God. I wish it wasn't the case today. Let's pray that it isn't. Amen? So she didn't know how her finance, uh, fiance excuse me, would respond. And uh, if he didn't agree to marry, marry her, she would probably re- remain unmarried for life. Think about that. So that wasn't good either, right? And worse yet, if her own father rejected her, she would most likely have been forced into begging or prostitution in order to earn a living. The, the prospects, the outlooks don't look very good here, folks. And then you have to tell people you were pregnant by the Holy Spirit? Come on, think about that. You were pregnant by the Holy Spirit? Uh, they're going to think I'm a little crazy. They're going to think I'm a little off the rail. The boxcar fell off, you know, one of those kind of things. You know what I'm talking about, right? Have you ever had to tell somebody something that you think, they're going to think I'm kind of crazy? Has anybody been there? It's not, it's not fun. There's a lot on the line here for Mary, right? A lot of the behind-the-scenes repercussions that could happen to her right? Despite this glorious visit from the angel, she could pay a big potential price. Not only, I mean, look at, think about it, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, in every way she could pay a price, a big price. But as we read last week, she could have doubted the news when Zechariah came to her, right? She could have, you know, when the angel told her, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be pregnant, and she could have doubted, uh, like Zechariah did. He doubted, right? But she didn't doubt, right? Uh, cause, but that's what Zechariah did. She didn't doubt. She, she could have laughed as Sarah did. Remember Sarah, when she found out she was pregnant, she laughed? She could have panicked as Manoah did. Remember Samson's father? He panicked. She didn't panic. She could have panicked. There would be a lot to panic about. Uh-oh, what about society? What about Joseph? What about dad? What about da 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 on and on and on it goes, right? Instead, she says this, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Wow. If we could all get to the place in our Christian life where we're like that. I am the Lord's servant. May it be unto me as you have said. God calls you to Iceland? You say that. God calls you to Africa? You say that. God calls you to that nasty neighbor? 
you say, yes, Lord, be it to me. As you have said, I'll go over there and talk to this nasty neighbor. This guy, oh, you know, he's got bad breath and he just swear and he's just, oh, but I'll go, Lord, if you say go, right? Doesn't matter, it doesn't matter where it is, who it is. We go when God says to go. We do what God says to do. And then she goes off to visit her relative Elizabeth. And the Bible records her song in Luke chapter 1. We're going to go to later, go down in your, verse to, uh, or your chapter to verse 46. And we're going to read there, starting with verse uh, 46. All right, here we go. Mary's song. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. She's praising God. She's not thinking about letting all that other stuff. She's keeping her eyes on the prize. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Wow. Wow, wow. What a response. She's got her eyes on the prize, Jesus. You know what I'm saying. Not but she's got her eyes on God, right? At that point, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. With, with all the ridicule and all these unknown consequences that awaited her back home, her, her response was amazing and from God. Joseph, her husband, though, a righteous man, right, didn't want to expose Mary to public disgrace. And so he thinks about divorcing her quietly. But we know the Bible tells us that an angel appeared to him in a dream, right, and told him not to be afraid but to take Mary uh, home as his wife because what was conceived in her was from the Holy Spirit and that she would give birth to a son and they were to give him the name Jesus. When he woke up, he did what the angel commanded him to do. That's a good question. Are we doing what the God's telling us to do? What the Holy Spirit's speaking to our hearts? He took Mary home with him as his wife, but had no sexual relations with her and, until she gave birth to Jesus. See, Mary and Joseph demonstrated obedience to God and his commands. And that continued on as Joseph obeyed the angel and as he appeared to him in another dream and told him to take the child to Egypt to escape King Herod because, of course, King Herod was trying to kill the baby Jesus, right? And then he obeys a third time when another angel appeared to him in a, in a dream and told him to go back to Israel because those who were trying to take his life are now, uh, were now dead. The, but the Christmas story really begins with the angel of the Lord visiting Zechariah, the priest, as he goes into the temple to do his normal thing, right? To burn incense. The angel Gabriel informs him that his wife will bear him a son. Instead of responding as Mary did when she got the visitation from the angel Gabriel, he responds a little bit differently, doesn't he? Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be unto me as you have said. Zechariah responds by saying, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. To me, it almost sounds like he's saying, prove it. Prove it, right? His response reveals really a heart of doubt. Church, this is not some ungodly guy, though. This is, he's not an un ungodly man. Really, he's just the opposite. The Bible makes that clear. In verse 6 of Luke chapter 1, it states that he... Uh, and his wife Elizabeth were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. Think about that. Or do we, that's where we want to be, right? Observing all the, uh, all the Lord's commands and regulations blamelessly. Zechariah was also a man of prayer. Hallelujah. We know that because right after the angel visits, he states that his prayer had been heard. His prayers had been heard, right? The Bible also says that when Gabriel shows up on the scene, that Zechariah was gripped with fear. Here's this upright man of prayer, right? Observing all of God's commands, yet he's gripped with fear and full of doubt. We look at that and we think, 
That doesn't make any sense, does it? But the bottom line is, as Christians, we can still be full of doubt and fear. Nobody said amen. Okay, I'll say it. Amen. Well, I guess I'm the only one that sometimes gets doubt or fear. Okay. Praise the Lord. Good, good job, Kit. All right, good job. Praise the Lord. So the Lord doesn't want us to remain there, however. He doesn't want us to stay in those things, right? So that you are not shocked when your prayers that you have been praying have been answered. And you're not afraid when God shows up in a powerful way in your life. Hallelujah. He answers prayer, and he wants to show up powerfully in all of our lives in 2021 on December 13th and beyond. When the disciple Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers uh, where the nails were, right, and put my, my hand into his side, I will not believe it. He was responding to the other disciples' claims that they had seen the Lord when he wasn't with them. A week later, they're all at the house, right? The Bible says the doors were locked, but that didn't stop Jesus from rolling in, did it? The doors were locked. Jesus comes waltzing right in and standing before him. Um, Hallelujah. And after allowing Thomas to see his hands and put his finger in his side, he says, stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. I think today, if Jesus would would say this to his church, stop fearing and believe. Stop fearing and believe. I always marvel at the story in Acts where you've got Peter in prison. The, The church is praying over in the house, right? Peter gets out, and Rhoda, the servant girl, comes, and he's knocking on the door. She comes to the door. She's like, Peter! She shuts the door, forgets to open it for him, runs back and tell, goes back and tells the other people, right? She says, I saw Peter. He's at the door. So they say, you must be out of your mind, right? Or you must have seen his angel. And the Bible says this. They were astonished when they saw Peter, when they went to the door. They were astonished. Really? They've been praying for this guy as a group, and now they're astonished that God did something and got him out, and he's here, and he's right in front of them. They were astonished. They couldn't believe it. Church, he is who he says he is. He did what he said he was going to do. You are a part of the Christmas story today. Over 2,000 years later, 2,000 years later, you are part of that. His redemption plan is still going forth today through us. Jesus is not walking on the earth right now going, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to go here, I'm going to heal this. No, it's, it's all of us in here, the Christians, the little Christ, right? They're first called at Antioch. It's us, it's us to go and, and it's us to do the job. There's no time for doubt or fear anymore. Amen. Two of my favorite people mentioned in the Christian story, and we talked about this last week, were Simeon and Anna. Oh, boy. You talk about believing. Here is one man and one woman who believes. Should I stay still because we're getting some feedback there? Should I stay still or just? Okay. Yep, something's going on there. Okay, well, anyway, praise the Lord. We'll try not to hit it. Hallelujah. So these guys, um, you talk about believing. Here they are, this, this older man, this older woman. Yet they were in constant preparation for the Messiah, as I mentioned last week. Simeon was a righteous and devout man, and he was led by the Holy Spirit. And that, that in itself was kind of an oddity, if you would, before Jesus dies, right? And he, was, oops, and he was in waiting for the Messiah to come and bring comfort to all the people of Israel. Think about that. He's ready and waiting for the newborn king, right? Then there was Anna, the old prophetess, who never left the temple, night and day, fasting and praying. Wow. Everybody else at the temple saw an eight-year-old baby boy. As Joseph and Mary brought them in to do the normal thing, to be circumcised, as was required by the law on the eighth day, Simeon and Anna saw the Messiah. The difference was they believed and were preparing themselves for his arrival. Are you preparing yourselves, as we talked last week, for his arrival? Their hearts were in a good place, in a right place all along. Oh, then there was good old King Herod the Great. Oh, boy. Whose heart had revealed a completely different uh, reaction when the, uh, then than anyone else in the Christmas story. The Bible tells us 
that when Herod first found out about his star in the east from the Magi, which signified that the king of the Jews had been born, it states that he was disturbed. In other words, he was jealous upon hearing this news. And there's a reason for that. The reason he was jealous is because he wasn't the rightful heir to the throne of David. And because of that, many Jews really saw him as someone was, who was on the throne illegitimately. And because of that, they hated him. They hated him. And see, here's the other thing. His reign was very vulnerable in Israel, being he was so far from Rome. And so he was vulnerable, and he knew that. His kingship, you know, sometimes we get, we get, it's like we think our position, we just don't want to lose our position. Folks, it's not about position. It's about God's power. It's about God in our everyday lives, doing everyday things through us. It's not about our positions in the church. It's not about that at all. It's about a heart after God and doing what God's called us to do. You can throw the positions down. You can get rid of the positions, throw them away, lay them, lay them down and just be done with them and move on in Jesus Christ. Those are the most important things. Be obedient to God. So when Herod hears this news, jealousy rises up in his heart. Are we, do we allow jealousy to rise up in our heart at all? Oh, sister so-and-so, she got the promotion at church. She's doing this. Or brother so-and-so just got his brand new, brother Joe just got his brand new Ford. I can't believe it. I, I've been trying to get a new car forever, and I ain't getting no new car. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. If God blesses someone, be thankful and happy. Hallelujah. Rejoice in the Lord if God blesses someone. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're supposed to rejoice when others rejoice. Mourn when they mourn, right? Hallelujah. But it didn't stop there. After he finds out from the chief priests and the teachers of the law that the Christ was to be born in Bethlehem, he secretly calls the Magi together. Then he tells them that when you find out where this baby was born, hey, could you let me know because I want to go there and worship him. Yeah, right. Right. His jealousy is now quickly turning into manipulation and lies. Right? Kind of one sin leads to another and another, right? It's just kind of the way it works, doesn't it? Right? And so Herod's fear was that this newborn king, that so many people did look forward to his coming. Of course, they were looking forward to a king, the king to take over Rome, right? But this was, this was the king of kings and the lord of lords. This king would take his throne away. See, he was addicted to power. I'm glad we don't have that today. <laughs> I got some amens, but that's kind of a joke. But anyway, praise the Lord. See, he didn't understand the, the real reason for Jesus coming to the earth. He's thinking that Jesus wanted his throne, right? Not true. Jesus wanted to be king of Herod's life. He wanted to give him eternal life and was not interested in taking away his present life. Church, he wants to give us eternal life. He's not interested in taking away any life. He, he gives us life and he gives it more abundantly to us. Hallelujah. But it's so important that we get a proper perspective of Jesus in our lives, isn't it? Otherwise, it can lead us to a lot of confusion and a lot of problems. Like Herod's skewed version of Jesus and why he was coming to earth. Herod had a different looking view of the whole thing. See, it, might, it may have started out with jealousy and fear, but it turned into, of course, like we said, manipulation and lies. And if you allow those things to harbor in our heart any kind of sin, it just turns from one sin into another sin into another sin, and it's never good. And then uh, that turned into anger and murder when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi. Ultimately, he had been outwitted by God, really, when you get right down to it, right? Yeah, that's it. So he gets furious, and he orders the killing of all boys in Bethlehem and in its vicinity who were two years old or younger. We're talking a virtual bloodbath here, Right? Think about it. Imagine if that were happening to our young boys. What was spoken through the prophet a long time ago in Jeremiah was now being fulfilled. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Mm. Wow. I need to pause right here and say this again, and I have it in my, in my notes here, but it's, you know what? We've got to be so careful. Those sins, that they, if they aren't checked and we don't check our heart every so often, I was just reading in Ezekiel today, we can get that heart of stone instead of a heart of flesh. 
We don't want to get that heart of stone. We want to keep our so hearts soft before the Lord. Ah, whatever. It's no big deal. Eh, I just did that. No big deal. Ah, oh, you know, it's no big deal. I did that. But the problem is you start going down that road, and you get farther and farther away from Jesus and closer and closer to the way what the, where the enemy would want you to be. Don't go down that road. Make sure, as we talked about in Sunday school, every night we're getting our heart right before God before we go to bed. Lord, forgive me of any sin today that I've committed. God, keep me pure and keep me righteous. Keep me holy before you. That's why it's so important to do a heart check every so often. I'd say really every night would be good. An examination of our hearts. Make sure we are in a right spot with God. Hallelujah. Let me just say this. We are not in competition with Jesus or other churches or with each other for that matter. We are all on the same team. Amen? Amen. We're all on the same team going toward the same goal, right? To win the prize and to bring others with us to heaven. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Wow, Herod abused his power, though. The question for us is, do we want all the glory, or are we going to give God the glory for what he does? Big difference, church, big difference. I can try to take all the glory, and trust me, you have nowhere to go but down if you start taking all the glory. You give him the glory and let God use you, you got nowhere to go but up. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And then there were the shepherds. Hallelujah. They received, there we go, they received, thank you, Chris, they received this great visitation from the angels of the Lord, and the glory of the Lord shines all around, and a heavenly host praising God all around them comes shining in. I know that happens in Kentland, Grand Rapids, and Rockford. Every day you wake up, it just happens all around your bed, right? Okay. But as soon as the angel leaves, the shepherds say to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. The Bible then says they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about the child. Mm, they spread the word of what had been told to them about the child. Yeah. Are you in a hurry to get closer to Jesus every day and go spread the good news how good news are the feet of those who go in the mountains, right? We know that in Isaiah, I think it is. And they go and they spread the good news. Are you ready to go spread the news of Jesus? Amen. There is a, at least one big difference between the shepherds and us today. They were spreading the word concerning what had been told to them about the child. Not all the church, but I hate to tell you, church, most of the church is silent about the greatest news that we have, the good news of Jesus Christ, and we don't even tell anybody. How can this be? That's the greatest news. We have the greatest news for the world. We have the greatest news for the world. Don't keep it in. Let it out. Get it out. Let it out. Let it go all over. Wherever you go. When you go to majors, and I'll tell you why I call it majors. I was in Florida, and we, we, I went to pay for the hotel. This was a couple, about six weeks ago, and the gal was from a different country. I mean, she had a different accent, but she was from here, but I think they were out of Arizona. And so she's going through the purchases, and she's like, uh, you got $40 at mobile, and you got, and she goes, $35 at majors. I'm like, $35 at majors? Oh, Meyer! Myers! Okay, I get it now. So she's, I, I got, oh, I see what she's saying, $35, Myers. okay. So I don't know why I went to that story, but anyway, it was just kind of funny, because I'm like, majors? Who's majors? But so my point is, many of us are quiet. Go to, oh, that's what it was. Go, when you go to majors or Myers, you tell the people. I mean, if God's putting on your heart to tell people about Jesus, do it. Amen. Share it. Pray for them. Smile at them. Say a good word. Do something. Just be a witness. If you smile all day long, that's a witness. People are grumpy today. People are sad today. They just continually look like they're eating, you know, something soaked in vinegar, like puffed rice, and it just doesn't look good when your mouth's like this. Put it up like this and shine the light of Jesus. Hallelujah. We got good news, church. We are to go out and spread the word concerning the child who has become the Messiah that now lives in us. If you're born again, you have no reason not to share all this good stuff. It ought to be oozing out of you everywhere you go. It ought to be oozing out of you. It ought to be just coming out of you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So we haven't just heard about him. We have experienced him in a personal way in our lives. He's just not somebody we're hearing about. He's somebody that's in us, the hope of glory. He goes with us every day. Whatever we do, he's with us. And he changes us. And he takes us through the hard times. And he's good there in the good times. And he's just there all the time. 
They, did, they didn't know all this, that all this baby came to do, but they were quick to spread the word. So should we, in the last days, we should do the same thing as his coming gets closer and closer. All right, I want to look at one other group of people before I bring this to a close, and they are called the Magi. Many would call them, as we said last week, the astrologers, uh, a lot of different things. They were highly educated, we know that, uh, kind of high people in society, if you will. Uh, but most likely Jesus was a year or two old, we don't know for sure, when they saw the star in the east and they soon after went to Jerusalem to find the king of the Jews so they could worship him. Do we find ourselves daily searching after God to worship him? Are we going after him? Are we following him? Is there that sense of urgency? If not, why not? Let's go after God, church. Let's get urgent. The day is getting short. Let's get closer and closer to Jesus. Because when we do, he's going to lead more people our way to tell people about Jesus too. Hallelujah. But like the shepherds we talked last week, they didn't pray for four years. Well, I'm praying about it. I've been praying about it since 1992. What God wants me to do. No, get up. And they got up and they went and they found the king. Yes, you should pray, but you should move too. Get some, get some action on your feet. And uh, like the shepherds, they set out and found the king to find the king. And only they did one other thing that's so important. They brought with themselves good gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Which the gold represented the Christ's identity as a king. The frankincense, of course, uh, represented God. And the myrrh, myrrh, which was used to anoint the dead. Wow, praise the Lord. Church, he's not a future king to us. That was over 2,000 years ago. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the bright morning star. He's all that and more. And we already know that. Hallelujah. The gift he wants from you is your heart and your life. That's what he wants. Will you give him that this Christmas and beyond in 2021? It's all he's looking for. I'm looking forward to a, a, a good year. I, yeah, I think there'll be some things we're going to still deal with in 2021. But I think, you know, we go through these valleys, we go through these things, and I, I'm believing that out of this, we're going to see some good things. You know, I think of back in the day in the early 70s, after the whole 60s and all that went on in the 60s, and you get in the early 70s, the charismatic move, many hippies were getting saved, many people were coming to Christ along uh, denominational lines, and we're getting filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm believing God wants to pour out His Spirit. I'm praying that God wants, is going to pour out His Spirit. I'm asking God for a last day revival, and I hope you are too. I mean, because that's His heart, that's His desire. And so let's believe God for great things coming up, Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. And so, as Christians, it's important that we examine our hearts and make sure that we're in that right place so that God can fulfill the part of the Christmas story that he has for us in our lives. I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss a thing when I go before the Lord. I, don't, I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in. I don't want him to say, well, <laughs> you missed this, you missed that, you missed it. No, I want to be doing the business, be about the business of the Lord's work. And I believe you do too. And so uh, just be sensitive every morning. God, you know, give me divine appointments today. God, help me, lead me, guide me as I go about my day to day. Let me be sensitive to those people you bring across my path. And let me be a testimony. And let me keep my eyes on Jesus. Remember, church, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. With all the distractions, all the divisions, all the infighting, all the stuff, remember the joy of the Lord is our strength. So keep focused on His joy. Father, I thank You for Your Word today. I thank You that it is life, it is truth. Lord, it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Lord, I pray that we will take that light, we will be that lamp, we'll be salt, we'll be light. Lord, wherever we go this week, we will shine it brightly and we will smile from ear to ear and people will say, what in the world? Why do you have that smile? With we'll open door to share the good, loving news of Jesus. And so, Father, anoint and bless your people, Lord, and bless them as they lie down, as they wake up, as they walk along the road, Lord, wherever they go, as they go to work, as they're at Majors and Myers and the gas station, wherever they go, God, bless them this week, I pray. And uh, Lord, bring them home safely today and God, bring them here Wednesday and we just thank you and praise you. In Jesus' mighty name and all God's children said, Amen. Amen and amen. Praise God. Go in the joy of the Lord, church. See you Wednesday.